ever addressed by that name. Today, we look at the name most used to identify our Savior, which is Jesus. Let me read to you again from Matthew chapter 1, those verses. Matthew chapter 1, starting with verse 18, says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus means Savior. He will save his people from their sins. The naming of a child is, uh, is an important process normally. Couples will spend hours uh, going through books and different uh, things looking for what they would determine that perfect name for their new son or daughter. And it's estimated that in Scripture, there are over 700 names and titles given to Jesus. And you say, well, why are there so many? Well, you know, especially back in biblical times, names had meanings. And, uh, and no one name can, can adequately describe who Jesus is and, and why he came. The, the most familiar names, though, of all the names and titles given to our Lord is the name Jesus. As a matter of fact, the New Testament begins with the name Jesus and it ends with the name Jesus. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, the book of the generations of Jesus Christ. So the very first verse in the New Testament speaks of Jesus. Revelation chapter 22, verse 21, the last verse in the Bible says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So the New Testament starts with Jesus, ends with Jesus, and about a thousand times in the New Testament, the name Jesus is mentioned. There's nothing like the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus was predicted in the Old Testament. It, the name Jesus is presented in the New Testament. The name of Jesus is proclaimed throughout the epistles. And the name of Jesus is praised in the book of Revelation that we're going through on Wednesday nights. There is nothing like the name of Jesus. It's a name, Scripture says, that is above every name. But even when we think of that, first of all, that, that name Jesus was a very simple name. Uh, reading through the Bible, as you know, some names are just almost impossible to pronounce. Jesus is easy to pronounce. Jesus, is, The name Jesus was a common name in Jesus' day. He had a simple name, and, and he identified and spent his time with simple people. He was brought up in a simple little town, a little town of Nazareth. Uh, he, he chose simple men as his disciples, and he conducted his ministry among the common people. When he preached, the Bible says, the common people heard him gladly. And today, as we celebrate Christmas, we know that even though his name is simple, there is majesty in that name. There is majesty in the name of Jesus. There is majesty in the name of Jesus. Good. Good. Heaven, heaven named him Jesus. With the song we're just saying, Isaiah 9, 6, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Yes, he was a child, he was a baby in that manger, but at the same time, he, he, he was, is, and always had been the Son of God, right? So, so in that song, he, he came as a baby. Unto us a child is born, but unto us a son is given. He had always been the son. He, he was from all eternity. Jesus had always existed. Somebody said heaven had to come down to us before we could go up to heaven. And, and probably if, if, uh, if, if some great man walked into this building, uh, we, we may all stand up. But if Jesus walked in this building, we would all what? 
we'd bow down, wouldn't we? We would bow down. Uh, the difference between Jesus and all the great men of the world. But, but not only was it a simple name, it was a very special name. Uh, that name Jesus in the New Testament is the same as the name Joshua in the Old Testament. And, and it literally means the Lord, the Lord of salvation. And when we think about, uh, we said last week, Emmanuel means God with us. Jesus means the Lord is salvation. Look at our first verse, Matthew 1, 21, and we, we just read that. She will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. You will call him Jesus, and Jesus means he will save his people from their sins. In the Old Testament, there were two men who were named Joshua. There's Joshua, of course, from the book of Joshua. He led the people of Israel into the promised land. He was a great conqueror. He was a successor to Moses. Our Joshua is Jesus, who will guide us and take us to the promised land. Our Jesus is a great conqueror. He has conquered death and hell and the grave for us, Scripture says. So our Jesus, our Joshua, is like the Old Testament Joshua in that uh, he, he, he is our leader and he's going to guide us and take us to the promised land. The second Joshua is in the Old Testament in the book of Zechariah. And that Joshua was a high priest. So we got Joshua, a great conqueror. We got Joshua, a great intercessor, a priest. And we find that Jesus is both those things for us, right? He, he's our conqueror and, and he's our intercessor. He's a hero and he's a helper. He's all those things to us. The high priest represented people before God. And Jesus is declared to be our high priest. As a matter of fact, it seems like in, in church and, and Bible study and preaching and all the things we do, we, we spend most of our time talking about who Jesus was in the past. And that's what we're getting ready to celebrate. Jesus coming, being born uh, in Bethlehem. And uh, Christmas is a great celebration. I love all parts of Christmas. But, but we spend a lot of time talking about Jesus' past, his, his birth, and, and, and then his death, and his resurrection, and his ascension back up into heaven. Or we spend a lot of time talking about the future with Jesus. And we're doing that on Wednesday nights, going through the book of Revelation. We're looking for his second coming. So we talk about his past. We talk about his future. But we don't spend a lot of time talking about his present. What's Jesus doing today? What's Jesus' function today? Well, today, it, the Bible says he's, he's our high priest. The Bible says he is seated at the right hand of the Father where he ever lives. His purpose for living today, where he ever lives to make intercession for you and me. He's interceding for us right there on the right, at the right hand of the Father. And, and we know from Scripture, from, from Job and other books, that, that the old devil has an audience with God at times. And, and the old devil comes by, and he's our accuser. He's the accuser of the brethren. He's kind of like uh, the prosecuting attorney. And, uh, and so he comes in the presence of God Almighty, and, and, and he says, oh, look at Pastor Dan down there. Boy, he messed up. He's been doing this. He's been doing that. But seated at the right hand of the Father is Jesus, and I believe Jesus holds up that right hand, and there's a nail print in that hand, and he says, Father, that's one of ours. That's paid for, already paid for. And he does it over and over again. I bet the devil gets frustrated, amen, when he, when he goes to accuse God's people because Jesus is right there to intercede for us. He, he's, he's our defense attorney. But not only is He our defense attorney, He is the one that paid the price for our sins. So don't lose track of where Jesus is today and what He's doing for you today. You and I, we're, we're frail and we're weak and we're human and we need someone to help us. And Jesus came to be our intercessor, to be our helper, to be our conqueror. He's overcome the grave, death, and hell for us. And, and, and we don't, we, we, it just blows our mind when we think about all that's available to us in that name, the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, demons were cast out and are cast out. We preach in the name of Jesus. There's healing in the name of Jesus. You, I'm sure you remember the story. 
Peter had healed someone in Scripture and, and, and then he was called in on carpet and, and they asked him, they said, by what power or by what name have you done this? And he responded and he said, let it be known to all of you that by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. He said, how did this guy get healed? He got healed by what? The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. And Peter reminded the, the, the hierarchy there, you guys put him to death. He is raised from the dead, and it's in his name that this man was healed. We, we baptize in the name of Jesus. We should do everything in the name of Jesus. Look at this next verse, Colossians 3.17. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of what? The Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. May everything we do here in this place be done in His name and for His name. Another time, Peter, when it was going into the temple, and you know the story, there's a lame beggar sitting there, and he's asking for money. And he asked Peter for money. What did Peter tell him? Silver and gold have I none. But he, he went on to tell him, what I do have, I give to you. And then he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And that beggar, that lame beggar stood up and was able to walk. He was healed when Peter called upon the name of Jesus. Listen, folks, there's power in the name of Jesus. When you're tempted, you need to call on the name of Jesus. When you're sick, you need to call on the name of Jesus. Jesus, that song, Carl, that says, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. The sweetest name I know. It, it's in the hardest times and the toughest times when I cry out and I say, Oh, Lord, in the name of Jesus, would you meet this need? Would you, would you work in this area? It's a simple name, yet it's a special name. But I'm sorry to share with you this morning, it's a very slandered name. When Jesus was born, he was immediately hated. Herod hated him to the point that, that he killed all of those young babies trying to kill the Lord Jesus because he, he felt like Jesus was a threat to his throne. Uh, the religious leaders hated him and felt that he was a, a threat to their position and their, their authority. The, the fickle crowd cried out and said, Crucify him, crucify him. And just as the name of Jesus was hated in Jesus' day, folks, the name of Jesus is still hated in our world today. There was, I've read about a, uh, a, a, a Christian club at a high school. And, and, and at Christmas time, the kids in that Christian club all they wanted to do was wrap up some bags of candy to give out. And on that bag of candy, it said, Jesus loves you. But they were forbidden to do it because they didn't want them to speak the name of Jesus in that school. You remember the dark day, uh, April twentieth, 1999, Columbine High School in Colorado. Two students full of hate, driven by evil, killed 12 students and one teacher that day, and then they killed themselves. And those two killers asked a group of students if any of them had faith in Christ. And a young lady named Cassie Bernal stood up and said she did, and they shot her dead in cold blood. She identified with Jesus and was shot by fellow students right here in our country. These two boys were allowed to come to school wearing trench coats with swastikas on them. However, if they had worn something with the name of Jesus on it, they would probably have been sent home for doing that or asked to remove it. We see the battles today over nativity scenes and, and saying Merry Christmas and all these things. We've seen Franklin Graham conduct, conducted a memorial for those students at Columbine and he was criticized for naming the name of Jesus. His father, Billy Graham, in a memorial sermon after 9-11, was criticized for naming the name of Jesus. But that, that's nothing new. We think, boy, the world's coming to a horrible place when you can't name the name of Jesus. But, but it's been true since Bible times. Uh, follow this story in Scripture. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. In, in Acts chapter 4, Peter uh, is, pe is preaching some, some incredible sermons. And, uh, and he and John... Uh, get arrested. Uh, they, they, they had put them on trial for what they were doing. 
And in verse 7, they asked him, they said, and, and, and when they had set them in the midst, they asked him, by what power or by what name have you done this? And, and then uh, down, down in verse 10, they said, let, Peter said, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And then look how this continues. And look what they said about Peter and John. They said, let's go back to 13, Gary, if you would. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And they realized then that they had what? They had been with Jesus. Can people look at your life and say, that guy's just a, he, just a simple person. But you know what? There's something about that guy. There's something about that person. They realized when they looked at Peter and John and thought, how do these guys have the power to heal somebody? And then they come to understand the only common denominator in their lives were they had been a follower of Jesus Christ. Folks, if you'll be a follower of Jesus Christ, there is power available to you in the name of Jesus. So what did they do? Look in chapter 4, verse 18. So they called them and they commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. They said you're not to... They, they, didn't, they really didn't know what to do with them. They had healed this guy and, and there was evidence there and the guy was okay and they were afraid if they put him in prison the people were going to be upset. They didn't know what to do so they just said, listen, you've got to quit speaking or teaching in the name of Jesus. Do we hear that today? I, I, and, and you've heard those news stories where where people like Billy Graham, Franklin Graham, were invited to come and, and to pray for a particular thing, but they were instructed before coming, now come and pray, but you can't pray in the name of Jesus. Don't mention the name of Jesus and you can come and pray. Well, listen, if, if my Bible's right, and I believe it is, if I can't pray in the name of Jesus, don't ask me to show up and pray. It would be a waste of time. It would just be words if you can't pray. In the name of Jesus. Don't let society convince you that we got to get rid of the name of Jesus. There's power in that name. So look what happened after they told them, don't you speak or teach in the name of Jesus. And let's move to chapter 4, verse 29. And, and, and so Peter and John go back to all the other believers. And, 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 and they're praying now. And look at their prayer. Verse 4 or chapter 4, verse 29. He said, they, they prayed and said, Now, Lord, look on their threats, those that were threatening them if they preached or taught in the name of Jesus. And then they said, Grant to your servants that with all boldness we may speak your word. Their prayer was what? Lord, regardless of their threats, may we continue to do everything in your name and in your power. And now, now look what they prayed for. They were praying your servants that with all boldness. They were praying and saying, God, give us boldness that we might speak your word. Now look what happens, verse 30. By stretching out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through what? The name of your holy servant, Jesus. They said, Lord, give us boldness, give us power, and that power will come. Let us do healing, let us do signs and wonders, and that will all be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. The authority said, don't you teach, don't you preach, don't you do anything in Jesus' in Jesus's name. And the disciples began to pray, and they said, Lord, give us boldness, and, and empower us to go out and continue to do signs, wonders, and healings, and, it, and may we do it, in your name. And look at verse 31. Look what happens. And when they had prayed, the place where they assembled together was what? It was shaken. Wouldn't it be great if God would just shake His place one day? Wouldn't it be great if we just called out the name of Jesus and said, Lord, in the name of Jesus, would, would you heal Jeannie of this cancer she's fighting right now? Lord, in the name of Jesus, would you bring new members? In, in the name of Jesus, would you build this place? And Lord, we're going to do everything in Your name. And we're going to honor Your name. And in a time when they say, don't speak the name of Jesus, give us boldness to do everything in the name of Jesus. And God would just shake this place. And they, not only did He shake it, they were all filled with His Spirit. And they began, what did they pray for? Boldness, right? And how did that end? They spoke the Word of of God with what? Boldness. God answered their prayer. Because they were acknowledging 
Jesus and the name of Jesus and the power that's in that name. And the world hates it. Ted Turner said Christianity is a religion for losers. Jesse Ventura, WWF wrestler turned politician, said organized religion is a sham and a crutch for weak-minded people who need strength in numbers. Entertainers joined the bashing. John Lennon of the Beatles made big waves when he said Christianity will go, it will vanish, it will shrink. I, uh, shrink. I needn't argue with that. I'm right. I'll be proved right. We're more popular than Jesus now. The Beatles said they were more popular than Jesus. Well, John Lennon has left this world. He stepped through the portals of eternity to stand before God in heaven. Um, Christianity's not dead, but the Beatles are pretty much gone, aren't they? Jesus is still on the throne. There's power in the name of Jesus. And why is it? Why is it when people curse, they want to use his name and turn it into a curse word? Uh, when, of all the words in the English vocabulary, why do they pick the names of God and Jesus when they want to talk in a derogatory manner? Uh, that's a pretty incredible thing, isn't it? That, that the world only speaks the name of Jesus in, in, in a swearing way. Uh, and, and, and when they do that, hardly anyone complains. But if you, if, if you speak about Jesus with respect, or if you want to pray in His name, then they begin to cry foul. You can't do that. Franklin Graham wrote a book called The Name. And he said the name Jesus is a lightning rod. He said it divides good from evil. It divides God from Satan. It divides light from darkness. The name divides righteousness from sin. Heaven from hell. The name of Jesus. It's a hated name. But let me tell you what. It's a saving name. Amen? Jeff, it's a saving name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Good. Um, Jesus, as we said, means salvation or Savior. And, and Matthew again, Matthew one twenty one. And that they and and they shall call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus means salvation. It means Savior. You and I are sinners, and and, and someone must save us. We needed saving because we can't save ourselves. And, and all our problems stem from our sin nature. And, and what are you doing about your sins? Look at 1 Timothy 1.15. It says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save who? To save sinners. Paul said, Of whom I am chief. He may have been chief in his day, but I think since I was born, I took over that position from him. We're all chief sinners. Amen. We are all sinners. And it's a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Jesus Christ came in the world to save sinners like you and me. And Paul said, I'm a chief sinner. And we could all say, no, Paul, that's me. I'm a chief sinner. Ultimately, ultimately all our problems stem from our sin nature. And uh, we need a Savior. And Jesus came in the world to save us. Our Savior is Jesus. Look at 1 John 3, 5. And you know that He was manifested. He was made known. He was born in that manger. He came to take away our sins. And in, him, and in Him, there is no sin. And we talked about that last week. As Emmanuel, He came, God, with us. He came to be the perfect sacrifice. And to die in our place. He was manifested. He, he was made known. He came to this earth. And His reason for coming was to take away our sins. The Christmas story is a story of how God chose to deal with with your sins and my sins. So Jesus, it's a simple name, but yet it's a special majestic name. It's a slandered name, but yet it's a savings name, a saving name. Look at Philippians 2, starting with verse 9. Therefore God also has highly exalted Him and giving Him the name which is above every name. Look at verse 10. That the name of who? Jesus. That the name of Jesus every knee will bow. 
those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth. And then look at verse 11. And that every tongue will confess that who? Jesus Christ is what? He's Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Listen, folks. Every Bible character, every Pope, every President, Ted Turner and Jesse Ventura, Frank Sinatra, Marilyn Monroe, millionaires, moonshiners, Larry King, Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden, Billy Graham, your boss, your neighbor, your spouse, your kids, you and me, we will all bow before Him one day. And you know what your choice is? You can bow now and make Him Lord. Or you can bow later when, when all others are forced to bow and acknowledge Him as Lord. Do it now. Don't wait till that day. Do it now. Look at Romans 10, 9. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. You say, you know, this salvation thing, is, it's hard to understand. I'm not really sure how you do that. That verse right there tells you how to do it. Confess. Confess means to what? To agree with God. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Confess that Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart, not in your head. This is heart knowledge, not head knowledge. Believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead. The Bible says if you will do those two things and do it the way the Bible intends for it to be done, it says you, you might be saved, you could be saved. No, it says you will be saved. And then look what it says a few verses later. Romans 10, 13. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, the key word in both those verses, Romans 10, 9 and Romans 10, 13, the key word there is Lord. Lord. Lord means He's your master. Lord means He owns you. Lord means you submitted your life to Him. Everybody wants a Savior, right? Everybody wants to go to heaven. We love it that Jesus is our Savior. But let me tell you something, folks. Everybody don't want a Lord. Everybody don't want to throw up both hands and say, I surrender, God. I give my life to You. I, I, you own me. I'll, I'll be Your slave. You are my Lord, and as my Lord, I will do whatever it is you want me to do. Look at Acts 4.12. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There's only one name, and one name only. And folks, this so goes against what the world says today. The world says today, you know, many paths lead to God in heaven. You just... You take this path and I'll take this path and we'll all end up in the same place. If what they're saying is true, then the Bible is a lie, right? Because that verse says there is salvation, that there is not salvation in any other. There's no other name under heaven given among men which we must be saved. There's only one name that will save us and that is the name of Jesus Christ who wants to be Lord of our lives. He's the way. The truth and the life, Jesus said. Jesus said, no man comes to the Father except by me. Friends, it can't be any clearer than that. Only through and by the person of Jesus Christ can anyone be saved. Somebody said Jesus is gentle, but He's not weak. Jesus loves the sinner, but He's absolutely intolerant of sin. Jesus is not a negotiator. He's, he's Lord. And Jesus did not say, do your own thing, and all roads lead to God. That might have made Him politically correct. But folks, He's not politically correct. He's Lord of all. So the question is, will you make Him Lord of your life? Will you kneel before Him? Will you say, Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to You. Lord Jesus, I want to do, as Romans 10, 9 says, I want to confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus. And believe in my heart that you're everything Scripture says you are. And if you do that, you can be saved. 
But you can only be saved if you'll surrender your life to Him and say, be Lord of my life. You own me. I give my life to you. You died for me, so I give my life to you. Everybody wants a Savior. Everybody doesn't want a Lord. But you can't be saved unless you're willing to make Him Lord. Would you stand with me? We're going to have a song of invitation and uh, I'm going to come. I better not leap off this stage. I better go take the steps. But I'd like to meet you right here at the front. If you'd like to make Jesus Lord today, I invite you to come and do that. We'll pray a prayer and you can confess Him as Lord. You can be saved today. If you have been saved and never been baptized, if, if He really is Lord of your life, He's instructed you after you get saved to be baptized. And uh, that's your first act of obedience. That's how you say to everybody else, I've been saved, is by being baptized. If you've never been baptized, but you have been saved, you need to come and surrender and say, Lord, I want to be obedient. If it, You're my Lord, and this is what you expect of me. Therefore, I want to be baptized. If you've done that, you've been saved and baptized, but uh, you don't have a church home, you're looking for a church home, and uh, God has led you to this place to become a member here, we invite you to come. And uh, we'll get you in the process of our, our members' orientation class and those kind of things and, uh, and, and have you to become a part of this fellowship. The, the Bible says the Lord places us in his body, that's the church, just where it pleases him. And, if it, and that's our prayer for anybody here today that's not a member of this church or any other church. Our prayer is that God will place you in the church where it pleases Him. And if that happens to be here, that'll tickle us to death. Amen? Amen. Amen. Would you bow with me? Father, we, uh, we thank You for the name of Jesus. We thank You, uh, Lord, when the angel appeared that, that His instructions to Mary and Joseph was that they were to name the baby Jesus. For He would save His people from their sins. Lord, I believe You're here this morning. I believe the power and the presence of the Spirit is here. And I believe, Lord, that you're, you're, You want to draw hearts to Yourself. If there's any here today that don't know You as Lord, then I pray this would be the day that they would bow the knee. They would throw up both hands and say, Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to You. Would You take my life and do with it as You see fit? I want You to be not only my Savior and save me from hell and take me to heaven, but I want You to be my Lord. I give my life to You. Father, by the power and the presence of Your Spirit, again, draw people for salvation, for baptism, for church membership, or if there's any that just needs to come and pray and, and, and let You intercede for them in heaven is what You're doing for us right now. Lord, uh, whatever the need may be, we pray by this invitation that people would be drawn to whatever it is You have for them. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Going to sing, Carl?